This is part four of the Ironclads of the Civil War series. Check out the earlier episodes to get the full backstory. We ended the previous episode with the CSS Virginia, also known as the Merrimack, leaving the Union fleet in disarray after destroying two Union warships in the first day of battle at Hampton Roads. Now, the North superweapon, the mighty ironclad Monitor, their last hope and defense to preserve the Union blockade, made its arrival and was ready to enter the fray. Let's find out what happens in day two of the epic battle for Hampton Roads. Hello and welcome to the Spark History Show, where we bring history to light. Take a dive with us into history and hear the real accounts of the stories of the past as they actually unfolded. Explore with us as we shine some light on the amazing events that shaped our world into what we have today. We are going to recreate the stories of the past to better understand the struggles and triumphs during the most epic moments in history. This is the Spark History Show. Let us begin the journey. The Monitor arrived to the scene of battle in Hampton Roads around 11 p.m. on March 8, 1862. Arriving in the dark, it took up a position near the fellow Union ship, the Minnesota, which was still grounded in shallow water and unable to move. The Monitor had arrived a day too late. If the ship had been there by the morning of March 8th, they may have prevented the Virginia from sinking the Union naval ship Cumberland and setting the fellow ship Congress ablaze. The Monitor was able to come up alongside the Minnesota at around 1 a.m. in the morning just in time to see the Congress exploding as the gunpowder ignited from the raging fires on board the ship. Two strong Union naval ships had been taken out in the day's fighting. A severe blow was made to the Union Navy with the sinking of the sloop Cumberland and the 50-gun frigate the Congress. The men of the Monitor were thirsty for revenge and to take on the Confederate ironclad the Virginia in the coming day. Many were unable to sleep at night as their minds raced with visions of what would happen in the coming battle. As morning slowly dawned at Hampton Roads, the Minnesota tried to free its keel from the muddy bottoms of the shallows where it was trapped. The time was around 5.30 a.m. when the Minnesota realized that even with the changing tides creating more depths to the water, they were still unable to break free and had to sit there, remaining immobilized and an easy target. The early morning fog started to lift and offer clear views of the water from the nearby land. Tens of thousands of spectators had funneled into the shorelines around all sides of Hampton Roads to watch the battle that was about to unfold between the mighty ironclads. As the fog cleared, the stage was set for a perfectly clear day to witness the fight between the mighty superweapons of the divided America. When the Monitor had first arrived, there were cheers and hurrahs from the other Union ships. The savior of the Union had finally arrived. But the sailors gazed over at the strange design and build of the Monitor, and some were more than a little baffled. What was it exactly? It didn't look like any other ship that had ever been produced by the Navy. The Union sailors had just witnessed an enemy with a large and heavily armored ironclad ship plow through their fleet, and now they were looking at a smaller vessel that only had a small metallic turret and pilot house even visible above the waterline. This was in contrast to the Virginia, which looked more like a standard hull of a ship simply encased with armor. Could this new monitor vessel really be their savior? Would it be able to take on the powerful Virginia? Doubts were raised but everyone on the Union side hoped for the best with this strange and, at first sight, somewhat underwhelming vessel. The Monitor was their only hope to save the Union Navy from oblivion. The crew of the Virginia also woke up to prepare for the day's battle. Captain Buchanan was transferred to shore due to his injuries from the day before, and everything was checked on the ship to make sure it was in working order. The ship was then led by acting Captain Jones and started to get underway at around 6.30 a.m. The Virginia began to travel north to the mouth of the Elizabeth River, where it was joined at Hampton Roads by three of her escort ships following in support. The ship set a straight course for the Minnesota to finish her off from her grounded and immobilized position that they were forced to leave her in the day before as night had fallen. As the Virginia entered more open water from their protected area on the river, they could make out the site of the USS Minnesota, still aground where they had left her. But wait, what was that? 
there was some strange object parked in the water a little bit east of the Minnesota. As they came into the clearing, the object now became visible. The crew speculated as to what it was. Maybe it was a raft that the Union soldiers were using to evacuate the Minnesota in the face of their arrival. Maybe it was a water tank refilling the ship. Some even joked, maybe it was even the infamous Union Monitor. Lieutenant James H. Rochelle from the escort ship Patrick Henry described it as, quote, Such a craft that the eyes of a seaman have never looked upon before, an immense shingle floating in the water with a gigantic cheese box rising from its center. No sails, no wheels, no smokestack, no guns. What could it be? End quote. And in case you are not familiar with the terminology, a cheese box is usually in the shape of a short and fat cylinder. This is actually a pretty good description of how the monitor's turret looked above the waterline. Another naval man at the time called it a tin can on a shingle. It was soon realized as the Virginia moved closer that this strange object ahead of them was indeed the Union monitor that had come to thwart the Virginia. The morale of the Virginia's crew took a slight hit as they only had one day of fighting against the blockade and did not clear it before the arrival of the enemy ironclad. The Virginia, however, was still prepared for a fight against the new hope of the Union Navy. The time was approaching 8 a.m. as the Virginia and her escort ships bore down on the USS Minnesota. The men on board the Monitor had been eating breakfast when spotters pointed out that the enemy ships were in sight and the crew dropped their breakfast and rushed to their battle stations. The outside of the ship was made ready and prepped for battle, and then the men scurried back inside the hull. The last two men standing on the top of the turret saw a cloud of smoke burst from the Virginia. A moment later, a shell whizzed past and slammed into the side of the Minnesota. The battle had begun, and the last two men hurriedly made their way back below decks before the enemy fire could take them out. The final iron hatches on the monitor were snapped shut to the outside world, sealing the crew into their protective iron shell. The fires in the boilers were stoked, the men were at the ready, and the monitor was set for battle. Inside the turret of the monitor, it was dark and damp. Here, the gun crew loaded the two cannons of the ship and then stood in their ready positions. The gun ports were left closed, shielding the guns from enemy fire until they were to be used, and there were no windows or accessibility to view what was occurring on the outside of the ship. The men of the Monitor now sat and waited in eerie silence for the battle to come to them. Their job was to protect the Minnesota as well as the other Union blockade ships and sink the enemy superweapon, the Virginia, or as they called it, the Merrimack. Without the ability to see what was going on outside, it must have been pretty nerve-wracking. Eventually, they started to hear the echoes of shots fired off in the distance, and then the sound of a broadside from the nearby Minnesota being presented as return fire at the Virginia. Back on the Virginia, the captain drove the ship onward to the target of the day, the Minnesota. The bow cannon of the Virginia was the first to fire at the Minnesota as the ship closed in the distance between them and their enemy. At the same time, the monitor started to push forward toward the Virginia to intercept her course to the Minnesota. Plumes of smoke shot out of the gun turret as the monitor fired its rounds of its two 11-inch Dahlgren guns at the Virginia. As the cannon shots bounced off the iron sides of the Virginia, all of the Confederate crew now realized that this was the ironclad that had come to defend the Union fleet. Captain Jones of the Virginia decided to ignore the first shots of the Monitor and continued towards the Minnesota until they would be close enough to destroy her. Jones's mission was to finish off and sink the Minnesota. The monitor continued its intercept and would open the shield on the gun ports, fire the two heavy cannons in the turret, close the gun ports again, and then swivel the turret away from the Virginia as the guns would be reloaded. In this manner, the ironclad offered very little of a target for return fire from the Virginia. All that the Virginia had to aim at was the side of a heavily armored turret and the small armored pilot house near the front of the ship. As the Virginia continued to be pelted by the incoming ironclad, Captain Jones decided for a change of plan. Since they were not able to get close enough to the Minnesota and were being engaged by the Monitor, they would turn and face the enemy ironclad directly. The two Titans would duke it out, head to head. 
Around 8.45 a.m. in the morning, the Virginia centered her attention on the monitor and abandoned her course for the Minnesota. The two iron juggernauts steamed closer and closer to each other until they were within 50 yards between them, the whole while firing their guns as fast as they could be reloaded. The two ships fought to bring down the super weapon of the opposing navy as they zigzagged back and forth around each other, probing for weak spots in the enemy's armored hull with their cannons. One of the first shells that hit the monitor with a loud reverberating thud actually dented the inside of the monitor's turret. Listen to this exchange between the commanding officer Samuel Green of the monitor with his engineer Albin Stimmers describing the incident. After hearing the impact, Stimmers called out, Did the shot come through? Green turned in reply. No, sir, it did not come through, but it made a big dent. Just look at there, sir. He was highlighting the giant bulge on the inside of the turret in the shape of a cannonball. Stimmers responded, A big dent? Of course it made a big dent. That is what we expected. But what do you care about that so long as it keeps out the shot? This small exchange actually led to the feeling of relief for the other men in the turret. The monitor had never been able to be fully tested in battle until this moment, and the ability of the armor to hold its own against the shot of the enemy ironclad greatly increased the morale of the men, who felt a bit safer on the inside of this prototype vessel. The two ironclads continued to try and maneuver around each other to gain the best firing position while at the same time presenting the enemy with the worst target. The monitor, being smaller and of less weight than the Virginia, was able to be more mobile during the fight and was making it difficult for the Virginia to get a full broadside on her. The inside of the ships began to fill with smoke and soot from the continuous cannon fire. Remember, they were using black powder in the time of the Civil War. Today, if you see a rifle or artillery fire, they use what is known as smokeless powder. The smokeless powder was not invented until around 1884, which happened some time after the Battle of the Ironclads here. Using the black powder in the ironclads left the crew with extremely rough conditions inside the vessels. It became so hot inside the monitor that the men were dripping with sweat. When they turned their heads, sweat would fly off of their brow and onto the floor. And it pooled on their faces, stinging their eyes as it dripped down. But the crew continued to fight on. Many took off the shirts from their uniforms to relieve some of the heat and their chests and back became covered in black soot from the smoke from the gunpowder. It took about seven minutes for the crew of the monitor to fully load the cannons and be prepped for another shot. Unlike today, the reload process of the cannons of this time period took a lot of time and effort which took a toll on the men. Manually swinging the extremely heavy iron gun ports open and close on the ship became a more and more burdensome task as the crew grew exhausted from the battle. Finally, the decision was made to just leave the gun ports open through the rest of the engagement. The men inside the turret could hear the shots ringing off the Virginia's armor after they hit the ship and they knew they were on target, but no one could really tell if any shots were getting through or causing substantial damage. The fight continued. After the onset of the battle, it was discovered that the speaking tube on the monitor was malfunctioning, and orders had to be sent by runner from the turret to the pilot house to coordinate the attack. A speaking tube is something that has been used on ships for ages, and can even be seen on some of the old World War II ship museums if you are able to check them out. Basically, it is just a long metal tube that ran from one part of the ship to another. Commands would be shouted into a megaphone-shaped mouth on one end of the tube, and the vibrations, which are the sound of the person's voice, would travel through the tube and come out of the megaphone-looking receiver on the other end for the target to hear. It enabled an easy way to instantly issue commands along the long distance and many rooms of a ship before the telephone started to be used in more modern times. The problem for the monitor was that for some unknown reason, the speaking tube was not working. The men were ordered to remain silent during the fight to allow the shouts of the officers making the orders to be heard. Since the runner had to traverse the ship between the turret and pilot house, it meant there was a significant delay between when a command was issued and when it would actually take effect. The Union crew tried to overcome this handicap as much as possible during the fighting. The two ironclads continued to maneuver around each other, keeping up steady fire. They were burning through a large amount of gunpowder in the battle, 
and yet they still could not sink the enemy ship. Over an hour went by with the Titans locked in combat, with some trouble on both sides, but no fatal threats to either ship. The Virginia had started to spring a number of leaks as time went on, and water began to accumulate in the lower sections of the hull. As the swift monitor maneuvered around the Virginia, the Virginia continued to have its steering degraded by the water sloshing around in the bottom of the ship, weighing it down. Pumps were fully operational, dumping the water back outside and preventing the ship from sinking, but they were not enough to completely remove the sheer volume of water from the leaks. The strain that the leaks put on the ship meant that a simple turn to line up a broadside against the monitor could take upwards of 15 minutes. The steering wheel of the ship would vibrate and stutter as the men tried to turn the vessel. This is similar to if you have ever driven a car with poor alignment or warped rotors. The steering wheel vibrates as the weakened mechanics of the vehicle fight against your steering. A number of the shots from the monitor dented and cracked some of the iron casemate of the Virginia. The problem for the monitor was that they were not able to repeatedly hit the same location on the enemy ship. If they could drive a few shots into the same spot, the Virginia's armor might actually be breached. Once the iron was broken in an area, one shot of cannonball could puncture the wooden backing and enter the innards of the ship, causing catastrophic damage. Luckily for the crew of the Virginia, the monitor's gun crew had a very tough time organizing and aiming their shot between the rotation of the turret the lack of clear visibility to properly aim their shots, and the slow distribution of orders between the pilot house of the ship and the rest of the crew due to the broken speaking tube. The fighting continued to around 10.30 in the morning. During the maneuvers, the Virginia's pilots had become disoriented as to where exactly they were in the bay. All of a sudden, the ship lurched with great force as the hull scraped into solid ground in a shallow area of the body of water. Orders screamed out to throw the engines into reverse as they were shouted through the ship as the crew realized what had happened and the danger it could put them in. The ship had to back out of there or they would be a sitting duck. The ship, now dead in the water, refused to budge. The hull strongly stuck in the mud. The monitor, seeing the Virginia in distress, closed in for the kill. The Minnesota was still relatively safe, around a mile away from the now grounded Virginia. As the monitor approached, it began to circle its prey, the Virginia. Every so often, the shots from the two large cannons of the monitor would ring out as they barraged the Virginia with heavy ordnance, trying to find a weak spot in the enemy ironclad. The monitor finally found itself in a position where the gun ports of the Virginia could not angle their guns to return fire on the now non-moving monitor. At this point-blank range, the monitor unleashed a series of around six successive shots into the Virginia, for which the Virginia had no recourse. The noise of the smashing of the cannonballs into the armor echoed throughout the Virginia, and some of the wooden support beams on the ship holding the casement on the inside began to crack from the sheer force of numerous impacts. The crewmen cringed with the sound of the splintering wood, knowing that the next shot might be the one to punch through and hit them. During all of the fighting, the Virginia had used up much of their reserves of coal for the boilers, along with their onboard stores of powder and ordnance. The weight lost by these expenditures meant that the ship was now floating a bit higher in the water, leaving the unprotected underbelly of the ship exposed to enemy gunfire. If the monitor could strike at the right angle, they could break through the light armor on the lower section of the ship and cause a breach leading to water flowing in below decks. If the Virginia could not get released from the mud, it could lead to the end of the ship. Their position had become completely compromised. The engineer of the Virginia, Ashton Ramsey, ordered that everything that could burn hotter and faster than coal be thrown into the fires of the steam boiler powering the ship. The crew needed to increase the steam pressure to create more power and force the ship out of the mud. Wood, linen, and turpentine were thrown into the boiler, causing the fire in the furnace to rage with fury. But still, the ship refused to budge. As the pressure in the boilers built up to the danger zone, Ramsey made a risky move and ordered his men to tie down the safety release valves. These valves let excess steam escape when the pressure gets to the point where it may cause the entire boiler to explode as it can't hold back the extreme pressure. 
This was a huge gamble. If the boilers exploded here, it would likely destroy the entire ship and kill a number of the crew. Steam is a very powerful force. Think of a tea kettle on the stove and the noise it makes when the steam starts to be forced out, creating the whistling noise. If all of that force is trapped, the steam just keeps building and building up pressure until it is enough to break whatever container is trying to hold in the intense force. The entire crew of the Virginia sat in waiting to see which would happen first, the boilers exploding leading to their demise, or the ship would be set free. At first, nothing happened. The steam continued to build up past the red line on the boilers. The men stood there, dripping sweat in anticipation. The boiler fire, a raging inferno, sounds of enemy shots ringing off the casemate echoing throughout the ship. Suddenly, there was a lurch of the ship. The men looked at each other as they regained their balance. Then slowly but steadily, the Virginia was able to break free and pull away from the mud. The hull of the ship ground against the seafloor as it backed away into deeper water. The Virginia was free and pulled back into the deeper water away from the ridge or sandbank or whatever it was that created the shallow patch that they had smashed into. The monitor was able to get a large number of uncontested shots in on the Virginia. Most of the crew of the Virginia were eager for retaliation and once the sights were lined up began to once again engage the monitor with heavy iron shot. After a little while it was discovered that one of the gun batteries on the Virginia was not firing anymore. Captain Jones of the Virginia made his way through the ship over to Eggleston, the officer of the cannon that remained idle. The crew was quietly resting at their posts as Eggleston ordered them to do. Jones was shocked seeing this and demanded an explanation as to why they were not engaging the monitor. Eggleston responded, and I quote, It is quite a waste of ammunition to fire at her. Our powder is precious, sir and I find that I can do the monitor as much damage by snapping my finger at her every five minutes. End quote. Eggleston's statement showed the demoralizing effect on morale in attacking an enemy for hours on end with no discernible negative effect on their adversary. As the rest of the firing on the ship continued against the monitor, Captain Jones decided to take another approach with the Virginia. He was going to ram the monitor. After Eggleston's comments and seeing the lack of any visible damage on the enemy ship, another plan of attack needed to be devised. If ramming the previous day had worked so well against the Cumberland, then it would probably have a significant chance of success against the Monitor today. The full mass of the Virginia at full steam headed into the Monitor would surely cause enough damage with their forward ram to punch a hole in the enemy ship's armor. The Virginia was ordered to move full speed ahead towards the monitor to prepare for the ramming of the enemy ship. There were two small problems with the plan that Captain Jones had decided to initiate. One would be that although under normal circumstances at full speed the Virginia's ram would be able to punch a hole in the monitor, the ship did not have enough distance between them and the enemy ship to reach full speed. There was only about half the required distance, about a half mile, and the Virginia, therefore, would not be able to make full steam. The other glaring hole in this plan, as we look back on it now, was that the ram of the Virginia had actually been torn off below the waterline from the bow of their ship when they had slammed into the Cumberland the previous day. The ship's inspections had failed to notice that the underwater ram was missing, and that they would instead be ramming the monitor with a weak wooden hull. Unaware of the missing ram, Captain Jones continued forward with his attack. The Virginia was bearing down straight towards the monitor. The men in the monitor's pilot house noticed that the enemy ship had a change of tactics and quickly realized that the intent of the Virginia was to ram their ship. A runner was sent to the turret to let them know to prepare for an impact and have the guns ready to fire once the enemy ship was up as close as possible to their ship. The pilot at the helm of the monitor spun the ship's wheel to cast a course for the ship away from the Virginia. The intent of the Virginia was to strike the monitor dead into the side of the ship. But if the monitor was able to maneuver and make them hit at an awkward angle, some of the force of the impact may glance off. The monitor had proved successful against the enemy cannon fire, but they had no idea what would happen if the ship was rammed. The armor below the waterline was much thinner than that above the waterline, and there was a high probability that the Virginia would penetrate it as they had done on the wooden side of the Cumberland the day before. 
Cannons still blazing and onlookers watching from shore, the two ironclads drew nearer to each other as the Virginia closed in for the ram. The monitor was able to successfully maneuver the ship to prevent the Virginia from hitting them head on, but they were not able to get completely out of the way of the vessel. Just before the Virginia was going to hit the monitor, Captain Jones ordered to fire the engines in full reverse. Jones did not want to have a similar occurrence to what had happened the day before, where they got stuck in the Cumberland and almost went down with the sinking ship. Due to the timing, the effect of the change in engine power diminished the overall ramming power of their ship. The Virginia slammed into the monitor at an angle and then glanced off. The entire monitor shook with the impact from the heavy ironclad. The Confederate onlookers from shore cheered their ironclad on, believing that the monitor was dealt a fatal blow. The monitor's crew quickly set about to check for damages. The Virginia could have potentially knocked a giant hole in the side of their ship that could be flooding them with water, compromising their buoyancy. To the delight of the monitor's crew, there was no significant damages observed. The actual spot where the monitor was rammed had a dent in the iron side, but there was no breakthrough. The Virginia did not fare quite as well. Not knowing that their iron ram was missing, they had rammed the enemy ship with the tender wooden hull of their vessel against the enemy's heavy iron armor. A report came in to the captain that the bow had sprung a leak after the impact. The water coming in was able to be managed by the pumps at the current moment, but it did weaken the bow of the ship, which would be vulnerable if enemy cannon fire could hit the water line on the bow. The fact that Jones had slowed his ship directly before the impact had actually helped him prevent more severe damage to his own ship. While the Virginia moved in for the final hit with the ramming action, the monitor fired both of her guns simultaneously at point-blank range into the aft sections of the Virginia. The rear gun crews of the Virginia were knocked down by the concussion on the iron casemate from the hit and were bleeding from the ears when they stood up and regained their composure. The location of the shot left an indentation in the iron casemate nearly three inches deep where the shells made impact. If the monitor was able to once again fire into this location, the iron armor would surely give way in its weakened state and allow the shot to penetrate into the Virginia. The Virginia actually ended up with the worst damage from the ramming operation that she herself had initiated. The Virginia returned fire as the ship made impact and bounced off the monitor and the close range meant that the monitor's armor had to take the full force of the incoming shells as there was no long distance and air resistance to reduce the force. Every shot that would hit the monitor would echo the blast through the ship, ringing the ears of all those inside. The force of the impacts was so great that some of the nuts on the inside of the turret that were attached to the bolts holding the armor in place actually flew off the bolts and went flying through the inside of the ship. With the speed at which the nuts flew off the turret, they hit some of the crew members causing giant bruises and welts. Luckily, no one was hit in a vital area and the crew was able to remain at their posts despite the bruising. While again in close quarters, the shells continued to fly between the vessels. The monitor had one man knocked unconscious from the concussions of nearby shells impacting on the turret wall. The crew of the monitor realized that the powder and ordnance supplies remaining within the turret was running dangerously low. To replenish the supplies, the turret would have to be spun to the point where the hatch to the below decks was accessible and more firepower could be brought up from the armory through the hatch. They didn't want to be stuck in a position where they couldn't change the direction of the turret to aim at the Virginia, and so the monitor swiftly broke away from the engagement to shallow waters where the Virginia could not follow. There, they could be able to safely replenish stock. For about a half hour, the monitor resupplied the turret with powder and shot. During this time away from the battle, they opened up a direct line of sight to the Minnesota for the Virginia. Now around 11 a.m., the Virginia took the opportunity to re-engage the Minnesota and began firing shots from her bow at the wooden ship. Hits were able to be made and a shot actually hit the smaller tug next to the enemy ship that was aiding the larger vessel, smashing into the boiler and causing the tugboat to explode. With the monitor now rearmed, Warden commanded that they steam ahead back to the Virginia to block its path of moving closer to the Minnesota and re-engage the enemy ship. The ironclads again moved within throwing distance of each other to battle it out.
The crew from the Virginia peeked through their gun ports to see the damage they were doing to the monitor after the heavy bombardment. But then they realized that there was no discernible damage that could be seen. The same was true of the Virginia. The armor on both ships had held up just as well as the inventors had hoped. At times during the fighting, the ships were so close together that some of the crew suspected that the sides of the vessels had actually bumped into each other. The frustration mounted inside the Virginia as they were just unable to get by this strange shaped iron ship placed before them and onwards towards their mission of attacking the Minnesota. There was talk of a boarding action starting to come to the surface on the ship. If they could not punch holes in the monitor with cannons, maybe they could hop on board and pry the hatches open and attack the crew. They could hammer wedges into the base of the turret, preventing it from oscillating. One crew member even suggested that they cover the viewing slits in the enemy pilot house so that the enemy ship would not be able to see to maneuver. At the last moment, Captain Jones called off any form of a boarding action. It was a good decision for the crew of the Virginia. The monitor had actually been equipped with grenades by design of Captain Warden as he had been anticipating ways in which the enemy might be able to stop the iron monster. In the event of a boarding action, the grenades were to be tossed onto the deck, and since there was no cover, the grenades would explode on the deck and the shrapnel would hit all of the men of a boarding party. A boarding party from the Virginia would most likely have sustained very high casualties. Captain Warden on board the Monitor was also struggling with the seemingly impenetrable ironclad that he faced. Changing tactics, he realized that if they could take out the enemy ship's rudder and steering mechanism, they would leave her dead in the water and easy prey. The Virginia would eventually have to surrender if they had no ability to move the ship and were trapped in the bay. To take out the rudder, Warden maneuvered his ship to a position where they could ram the stern of the enemy ironclad where the rudder sat slightly below the waterline. The ship was lined up, full steam set, and the monitor plowed its way towards the stern of the Virginia. Closer, 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 then just at the last moment before the ship was going to make contact with the Virginia, the monitor's steering malfunctioned, and the ship quickly veered off away from the enemy ironclad. This caused the monitor to miss the stern of the Virginia by what some have said was merely a few feet. If the monitor had managed to ram the Virginia, it may have turned the tide of the battle. But the crew of the Virginia were now aware of the new plan by the monitor, and additional ramming attacks could be thwarted without the element of surprise. With the monitor slipping close by the Confederate ironclad, crew of the Virginia were once again able to see firsthand the lack of damage to the monitor's turret from all of their cannon fire in the battle, as none of the shots had broken through. After the monitor had passed, the gunners of the Virginia decided to instead focus their fire on the small pilot house protruding from the front deck of the monitor instead of the heavily armored turret. With the monitor now sailing past the stern of the Virginia, the aft gun crew of the Virginia set their sights on the pilot house at the short distance of only 20 yards. The shot was lined up. John Taylor Wood, the gunner captain, gave the command to fire, and the shot let loose from the 7-inch aft brook rifle. The shot flew across the short distance to the monitor. Inside the monitor, Captain Warden was carefully looking through a pilot hole to judge the surroundings after the failed ramming attempt. The shell from the Virginia smashed into the top of the monitor's pilot house and exploded. A blinding light and thunder of an explosion erupted from the impact. The entire inside of the gloomy pilot house was illuminated by the bright light that shone through the pilot holes. Shortly after the light, a plume of smoke and ash flew into the pilot house from the force of the explosion. Other crew members looked to see Captain Warden reeling back from the viewing window, clutching his eyes. When asked if he was okay, Warden exclaimed, My eyes! I am blind! The crew members carefully pulled Warden down from the pilot house on the ladder and laid him on the floor of the deck below. His face was completely covered in black soot from the exploding gunpowder of the shell. The quartermaster behind the ship's steering immediately changed course to set the monitor in the direction away from the Virginia when it was realized that the captain had been hit. A runner was sent to get Samuel Green from the turret, who was the next in line for command behind Warden. Upon hearing the news, Green quickly hurried over to the front of the ship and the pilot house to assess the situation. 
Realizing that he was not able to see and could no longer function in combat, Warden passed on command to Green with the intention for him to do everything in their power to save the Minnesota from being destroyed by the Confederate ironclad. Warden was then taken back to his cabin. The crew of the Virginia observed the Monitor pulling farther and farther away from their position, but they were unsure of the reasoning for this. They could be retreating, or they could be trying to lure the Virginia onto a shallow sandbank and run her aground. They had no way of knowing that the shot to the pilot house had actually taken the Monitor's captain out of service. The Monitor ended up disengaging for a period of around a half hour as Green took command of the Union ship and the damage to the pilot house was assessed. Captain Jones of the Virginia considered what his next action should be. He wanted to re-engage the Minnesota, but his pilots advised him that they could go no closer to the Union ships, as the tides were going out, and it was becoming too shallow for the Virginia to safely move forward. With the current range to the enemy, the weapons of the Virginia would take some time to be able to strike a severe blow against the Minnesota. With low tide, if the Virginia stayed in Hampton Roads too long, they would be trapped there and unable to return up the Elizabeth River to safety. Sediment that had run down the river and into the bay formed a sandbar at the mouth of the Elizabeth River. In low tide, there might not even be enough room for the ship to get over the sandbar without running aground. Reviewing the situation with the other officers on board the Virginia, Jones explained, and I quote, the Monitor has given up the fight and run into shoal water. The pilots cannot take us any nearer the Minnesota. This ship is leaking from the loss of her prow. The men are exhausted from being so long at their guns. I propose to return to Norfolk for repairs. What is your opinion? End quote. The majority of the officers sided with Jones. After all, they didn't want to risk having the Confederate superweapon sunk on only its second day of combat. Lieutenant Wood, who was the man in charge of the aft gun that fired the shot disabling the Monitor's captain, was the only officer who suggested they continue on to take on the Union Fort Monroe. The fort was a defensive position that prevented the Confederate ships from having a clear outlet to and from the sea into Hampton Roads. With the general consensus of the officers... Jones laid out the orders and the Virginia turned and steered for home, announcing a victory on the day with the assumption that the Monitor was forced to withdraw from damage that was dealt by the Virginia's cannons. Oh, and the whole time the Virginia steamed away from the Minnesota and the Monitor, Lieutenant Wood and his aft gun crew continued to fire long shots away at the Monitor as a sort of farewell. On board the Monitor, the damage was assessed that the pilot house had taken a strong blow with the iron log near the top cracking and moving back several inches from the hit. Another shot to the same area may fully knock out the pilot house, but the ship was still in working order and able to continue. Green, the now acting captain, ordered the ship to be turned around and once again engage the Virginia. Once the ship had completed the slow turn and faced the Virginia, they realized that the Virginia was already withdrawing from the battlefield. They tried to fire their cannons at the departing ship, but the now extended distance between the two vessels diminished the chances of a serious strike being dealt. Captain Green realized that their orders had been to protect the Minnesota and not to directly hunt down the fleeing Virginia. If they were to chase the enemy, it could bring them in range of the Confederate shore batteries and would place them farther away from Union support, needlessly putting themselves in danger. There was also the risk of a duplicate hit on the pilot house, which might penetrate the armor and handicap the ship. Green gave the order to halt pursuit of the Virginia and once again pull alongside the Minnesota in a protective position. During the battle, the Monitor had fired 41 shots at the enemy ironclad while taking around 22 hits herself. Their mission was now ended and claimed a success. The Minnesota was saved, and the Confederate ironclad was fleeing the battle line instead of continuing to face the Monitor. A Union victory was proclaimed. As you can see, both sides ended up claiming a victory in the Battle of Hampton Roads. When we look back at it today, it is typically thought of as a stalemate, but the Monitor was able to fully accomplish her mission and stop the Virginia from completing her own mission of destroying the wooden vessels creating the Union blockade. The Monitor was also able to hold the battleground of Hampton Roads. 
the small Confederate escort ships that had been firing ineffectively at the large frigate Minnesota while the ironclads duked it out now fell back along with the Virginia. The first battle of the ironclads was over. The Virginia escaped with only minor damages and no deaths on board the ship from the fighting, although there were a number of smaller injuries. The Monitor also had no deaths and only slight injuries, but they did have structural damage to the pilot house of the ship. Both of the captains were taken out of commission and injured by the enemy during the two days of fighting. Franklin Buchanan of the Virginia was injured on the first day by a bullet wound in the thigh when he tried to return fire at Union marksmen along the shoreline, and was later transferred to shore to treat his injuries. Captain John Warden of the Monitor was blinded by an exploding cannonball impacting the pilot house and was forced to relinquish his command, being taken off the ship for medical attention after the battle. Both captains later healed from their injuries and continued the fight on board other ironclads that were constructed during the rest of the war. All of the cannonballs on board the Virginia were the explosive shot to cause the most destruction and potential for fire on the enemy wooden ships that comprised the Union blockade. During the battle, they were only able to use the exploding shells and hot shot on the enemy ships. If they had solid iron cannonballs on hand, it may have been more effective against the enemy ironclad. This could potentially have cracked or penetrated the armor of the Monitor, but when the battle started out, they were unaware that an enemy ironclad was going to be greeting them. As the Virginia sailed back towards the dry dock, groups of small boats from the Confederate side came out to greet them. The crew of the ironclad, happy to finally get outside and above decks after hours of fighting on the inside of the Virginia in poor conditions, were greeted by their fellow countrymen cheering their return. They were seen as heroes. The men of the Virginia had proved that the Confederates had a realistic shot at destroying the Union blockade. The battle would also help to prove to England and France that the Confederates had a possible chance of winning the war and potentially receive support from the international community. The Confederate High Command was pleased with the showing of the Virginia in battle and sent letters of the details along with some of their own propaganda to England and France describing the news of the Virginia destroying ships of the Union blockade and taking on the Monitor. This news helped to cement the view of the European powers that the age of the wooden ship was finished. The battle at Hampton Roads clearly demonstrated that there was no match between a wooden ship against an enemy iron armored vessel. It also helped to show that the South was no pushover in the war and that they did have a fighting chance. After the Virginia had fallen back, the Monitor moved alongside the grounded Minnesota and her crew came out on deck for fresh air after around four hours of fighting. Cheers from the Minnesota erupted as the Monitor's crew came up and out into the open. The Minnesota's crew had been saved by the arrival of the Monitor and her protection from the Virginia in the battle. News went to the President of the United States and the members of the Naval Command that the Monitor experiment had proved to be a success. Captain Warden would end up meeting with President Lincoln on March 10th in person to describe the battle as it had unfolded, while the Monitor underwent repairs and rearmament. Although Warden was able to heal from his wounds as time went on, he was left with chronic pain, facial scarring, and permanent blindness in one eye from the battle. Since the Monitor did not sink or become easily destroyed in battle, the criteria for the final payment to the ship's designer, John Erickson, was completed. The Monitor had proved her seaworthiness in battle, and the final sum of payment to Erickson was released March 14th to him from the federal government. During the Union repairs, a new modification was made to the original design of the pilot house. It was rebuilt with iron armored and angled walls so that the additional shots focused on the pilot house would glance off and not have a direct impact on the flat surface. This was done in a very similar manner to the way the Confederate ship had an angled casemate which they would layer with grease to help deflect cannon fire. The Navy took what they learned from battle and put it to good use. While the two ironclads were being repaired, the title of captain on both ships changed hands as both of the original leaders of the vessels had been injured in battle. For the Monitor, 38-year-old Union Lieutenant William N. Jeffers was charged with taking command. 
He had 22 years of naval service and was expected to be a better fit for the role than those before him with less experience. For the replacement commander on the Virginia, the Confederates decided to go with 67-year-old Commodore Joseph Tattnall. Tattnall was the captain of the Confederate Navy for Georgia at the time and had resigned from his position in the Union Navy at the outbreak of the war after serving since 1812. He had previous battle experience in the Mexican War. The Union still wanted to use Fort Monroe and Hampton Roads as a staging point for an invasion of Virginia and the South's capital of Richmond to strike the Confederates a severe blow. The actions of the Virginia put a hamper on the plans as they needed to ensure that there was a clear channel across the water to bring in troops and supplies. The Union left this task of the invasion with General George B. McClellan. McClellan decided that with the showing that the Monitor had already presented, if they could take out the Virginia or at least contain her to Hampton Roads, he could march his troops inland. The Monitor would keep the Virginia at bay and protect the Union supply lines. McClellan devised a plan to take his troops north along the York River, which was a river some miles north of the landmass of Newport News, Virginia. The other rivers in the area all had outlets to Hampton Roads around the Newport News area. By circumventing these rivers and traveling westward on the more northern York River, McClellan and his troops would be able to circumvent the CSS Virginia contained in Hampton Roads. If troop transports sailed into Hampton Roads from the sea, they would first have to get past the Virginia before continuing to travel westward on any of the connecting rivers. The Virginia was trapped in Hampton Roads until they could take out Fort Monroe, which guarded the outlet to the sea, or the Monitor, which prevented them from moving up any rivers. This more northern route would allow McClellan to avoid the Virginia stuck in Hampton Roads while still charging west by way of river to attack Richmond. The new McClellan plan had come several weeks after the Virginia and the Monitor had been repaired. Everyone was waiting for a battle, but the two sides decided to play it safe and had their ships stay close to their supporting naval batteries on shore, knowing that the mere presence of the ironclad presented a hindrance to the enemy. Confederate spies were able to gain knowledge of the change in attack plans, and Captain Tattnall and the Virginia realized that he would have to take action or else his ship wouldn't be able to provide support if the Union decided to move west on the York River farther to the north. Tattnall and his crew prepared for battle. They designed a new strategy of attack against the Monitor. They were to board the enemy ship and disable or sink her. After the Virginia's troops were able to board the Monitor, sailcloths were to be draped over the pilot house and smokestacks, blocking visibility and causing the toxic exhaust and smoke to back up within the ship. Wooden wedges would be hammered into the base of the turret where it met the deck to prevent it from rotating. The fellow escort ships would also come in for support, launching boarding parties and tied lines to the Monitor to prevent her from escaping while keeping all of the Confederate ships connected to the Monitor. For the final blow, hatches would be forced open on the top of the turret and flammable material would be dropped into the openings. The crew of the Monitor would be forced to surrender their ship or it would be sunk. On April 11th at 6 a.m., the Virginia steamed into Hampton Roads to carry out her plan of attack on the Monitor. To create favorable conditions, the Virginia wanted to lure the Monitor into engaging her on the southern side of Hampton Roads, where the Confederate shore batteries on Craney Island and Seawells Point could also fire upon the enemy. They could also swarm the Monitor with their escort ships and would be in closer range to the south to tow the Monitor back to Gosport if they were able to capture the vessel. And so, the Virginia steamed along the edge of Hampton Roads, in clear sight of the Monitor, and tried to bait her in, where she could swoop in on her prey. What Captain Tattnall of the Virginia did not know was that Jeffers on the Monitor had the same type of plan in mind. Under orders from the higher-up Rear Admiral Louis Goldsboro, he was to play cautiously and try to get the Virginia to engage the Monitor within firing range of the heavy guns located at Fort Monroe. The main objective would be to prevent the Virginia from leaving the exit to the sea from Hampton Roads. As both vessels ended up having the same plan to lure the enemy in towards their shore batteries, 
they knew what the opposing side was trying to do and merely danced along on their own sides of Hampton Roads, neither ship willing to commit to a battle on the other's terms. Will the Monitor and the Virginia once again engage in a direct battle and duke it out until one of their armor fails and one of the mighty super weapons of the war is brought to the bottom of the sea? Well, stay tuned to our next episode to find out. This concludes part four of the Ironclads of the Civil War series. I hope you enjoyed the show so far, but we're going to have to take a short break and then you can hop right back into episode five. If you have been enjoying the show or you would like to help out the creators, please head over to the website at sparkhistory.com where you can listen to our other shows as well as support the production. Again, that is sparkhistory.com. Bring the past to light, one spark at a time. Please continue with episode 5 where we will be going into what happened to the Ironclads after their first clash in battle and how these mighty feats of engineering ultimately met their demise. Thank you for listening, and have an awesome day.